This week's episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 16th of February 2022 at home in Wicklow. And it is an episode inspired by vomit. That's right. Not yours. Not yours. Um, not that gag reflex you experience when you press play on this episode. But my own. And one way or another... I try to weave a thread from vomit to wellness and self-care and getting rid of the things that ail us. And I, I really build this whole argument around the idea of the body's singularity of purpose when it has decided it needs to get rid of something from your gut that is tormenting you. And this is an experience I just had very recently. And yeah, that's uh, that's what's going on this week. And I talk about the idea of poison and poison as we as we see it in popular culture and a couple of historical um, incidents of poisoning and poison in warfare and I then drag that out into the world of poison in our emotional and psychological lives and toxic personalities and poisonous self-talk and how we might try to approach those elements of poison, our unwellness, our toxicity in our lives with a a vomit inspired resource so that's it that's what's coming up um i hope you get something out of it i got something out of me (laughs) okay i'll see you there real soon cheers bye not gonna change my mind leaving the dream hi my name is dara clear and you're listening to clear out how are you so I have left myself quite the task. I have to get this episode recorded and prepared and ready to go uh, for my usual deadline, which is two hours from right now. (laughs) Yeah, it's just been... um, It's just been one of those, one of those days, one of those weeks, and here I am, right, uh, right on the wire. So if you're one of those people who listens to the, uh, the podcast just when it comes out, I'll literally have been, uh, finishing speaking probably less than 45 minutes before you start listening. Anyway whatever that is what it is so yeah this week's episode is going to start with vomit (laughs) and it's going to end with blockages and i'm sure you can you can see a connection there that's if that i hope i hope i managed to to end with that type of synchronicity but the the inspiration for this week's episode came at the end of a second violent bout of vomiting that I was enduring last Saturday. <laughs> so I was standing I was standing out out in the corner of the garden at night um heaving and sort of for you know i just had this moment where i was marveling marveling at the the violent efficiency or the efficient violence of what the body does when it wants to get rid of something that can be got rid of via via vomiting and i was 
as you know, as, as, as you will be familiar with that 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 excruciating pain of you know clutching your guts when that spasm to empty your your gut just will not stop coming to make sure every last possible drop of whatever it has been that was ailing you is gone 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 and that's where i was i had been feeling fine for the first half of the day my my wife had gone out to work my daughter had a friend over for a play date i'd made this old lunch they were off doing their thing uh, I was looking forward to watching the Ireland France rugby international in the Six Nations, and uh, my cousin here at hashtag blessed was coming over to join me for that, and I had a little nap after lunch, and probably about an hour before the game, I started to, I started to register <laughs> that something something was a foot, something was a foot in my in my gut. And the thought of food made me ill. And the thought of having to prepare dinner for my daughter and her friend made me feel ill. And I was just sort of battling it. And I I, I sat through the match sort of half clutching myself. And my cousin told me subsequently that by the end of the match I looked white. Um, you know, ghost-like. And um, I went out then to prepare some some dinner for the, the girls. And while that was cooking, I had to take myself down to the, the bathroom. And that was the first the first session of getting very, very unwell and getting rid of whatever was in my gut, all food. And I thought, I thought very optimistically that that was it. And I felt sure, OK, that's good. I'm going to feel better now after that. And while the girls ate their dinner, I drank a single pint of water. That was it. I dropped my daughter's friend back in to her her family and was not feeling well again at all. And I was sitting on the couch just about to just about to go out and try and put the those damned chickens away when my wife came home and she was able to take over that particular duty. And it was about an hour after that that I had to leave the house. I felt like I was suffocating. That sort of lack of air and a sort of a choking feeling around my my neck. And that was when the the second purge happened. And it was just water that came out. And my body seemed to I don't know, it probably you know, possibly the body's like, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's something I'm sure there's more than water in here and uh, we're going to get rid of it we're going to find it so don't worry pal don't worry we're on the case we're going to get rid of it for you it's grand and uh, you just you just stay there let us take over which is of course what it does <laughs> and it was somewhere it was somewhere in the middle of that session that i was like wow the body what an amazing thing and i thought and this is now you know this is the theme of today's episode I thought, poison, poison in the body, poison, poison then as a (laughs) poison, as a, as a metaphor for so many things and poison uh, and how it occupies a certain part of our imagination and where it lives in popular culture um, and where it has featured historically. I I thought there's a, a rich vein to be mined here along along this theme and i will endeavor uh, as i usually do to try and tie a little thread to wellness um around this theme and uh, i'm pretty confident i'm going to do it um so i know in last week's episode um which originally last week's episode was going to be about defiance and discipline uh, ultimately, it ended up being almost entirely about defiance, and I suggested that I'd come back to discipline this week. But I've decided discipline can wait. <laughs> that's um, 
that's going to be the the name of my new uh demotivational uh course discipline can wait sort of a anti-motivational idea and there's the thought so let's go back to the full stop that comes with getting physically ill the way i did uh last saturday i am a believer oh i'm I'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna go back on that a believer is going to push it into sort of maybe airy fairy territory i was trying to think about this earlier what i was going to say was i am a believer in life forcing you to stop and another way of phrasing that is i'm a believer in the universe forcing you to stop now in all reality do i believe the universe is making me stop do i believe life is making me stop i don't really i think it's just stuff happens and there's a sequence of events and again we can get back into the idea of what can be controlled and what can't be controlled and we're just a little bit of flotsam riding the waves of fate um now there i do there's a there's a part of me that does fundamentally believe that is the case and yet i would not ever describe myself as a fatalist uh i believe there is there is or there are always paths available you know down which we can choose to walk or choose to avoid um much like robert frost in the woods um but i do i do find myself framing the idea that way that sometimes the universe makes you stop and i accept and i think i've mentioned this before in previous episodes i accept that that's just a narrative it's a it's a framing device and it's you know it, it, it's a way of it's a way of thinking about things that i find i don't know i i suppose it, it there's a sort of a placebo effect to kind of going this is really way way beyond my control and actually maybe there's an active there's an active plan in this that there is higher power um or a larger a larger universal energy that's just putting the brakes on because i refuse to and and again as i lay that out i'm sort of there's part of me that's going ah yeah go on out of that would you however let's get down to the crux of it the crux of it is you can view these unavoidable stops as an opportunity to to take stock or as an opportunity to reboot as an opportunity to draw breath as an opportunity to regroup and go again and i do like that idea because i think what happens what can happen to some people and certainly i can sometimes experience this is there's a a stress and a tension that can coincide with a forced stoppage where you can find yourself resisting it and questioning it and wondering how you can proceed in spite of the stoppage and that to me is that's a very messy kind of energy um which ultimately leads to sort of in, you know in my experience it, you know it leads to half assing it it leads to not really fully committing one way or another and there's a huge amount of prevarication and there's a huge amount of oh what am i actually able to do here and a lot of the you know the, the expressing of frustration and the expressing you know the kind of the the frustration with wasted time or what you could have been doing or what you should have done by now and it's like all of that is just kind of pointless 
and it doesn't really get you anywhere and it's just it's just throwing you know your energy away when really your energy needs to be where it is which is focused on you recovering from whatever it is that has made you stop and in my case you know it it got even more literal than that i typically sleep five and a half to six hours uh a night that's that that's uh on average that's what i'd get you know always hovering around the six hour mark you know not that often more than six and often a little bit less and last saturday night um barring a couple of hours on sunday morning when i got up briefly um i basically slept for 13 hours and i can't remember i I actually can't remember ever sleeping as long as that and on sunday i just felt like i had you know been an unfortunate spectator who'd wandered onto the the pitch in paris where the ireland and france rugby match was being played and i got caught at the bottom of a of a ruck and sunday was just this pummeled battered destroyed version of myself collapsed on the couch uh unable to move and just in pain everywhere my stomach was fine, although I had no appetite. I barely had anything all day Sunday. And then Sunday night, again, I slept for almost 10 hours. Um, I'd set my alarm for, um, you know, five or half five. And I just, you know, went straight back to sleep. And on Monday, I didn't feel amazing either. And I had this pain through my shoulder from the vomiting. <laughs> but whatever way I was holding myself, wherever that tension came, um, Oh, it's amazing. That dread. Oh, my God. That dread of please, 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 stomach. Don't go again. Don't. And it. Uh, no. Uh, anyway. So, Grant, forced to stop. And it really was, after all that sleep, that, um, you know, that the almost like 24 hours sleep over two two nights which is yeah it's it's just astonishing to me it was like a reboot and of course the the the, you know exiting you know getting getting everything out of my system i did feel detoxed and it's a strange sort of airy light feeling that's that's how i experienced it anyway um but i did find it was like my my brain everything was firing um, that much sharper and I wasn't distracted by the usual crap I'm distracted by on my phone or you know online whatever um, I just seem to have a, a focus and a, and a clarity of thinking that had been missing um, and certainly last week I I'd had a bit of a you know I, I certainly had some struggles with sort of with with anxiety and a bit of negative thinking last week and you know it was a bit of a battle I, I referred to um i referred to the effort it was taking me to to record last week's episode when i was doing it and not feeling very forward facing um but on the other side of this uh, this bout of sickness which for some reason, I, I decided it was a bit of food poisoning, although neither my daughter nor her friend got sick. And I was tracking it back to a grapefruit that I perhaps shouldn't have eaten on Saturday morning, that maybe it had turned. Um, my wife was a bit skeptical about that theory and thought, no, it's a tummy bug that just, I mean, the, the speed with which it struck in that case was insane. Um because it happened over about 60 minutes from feeling 100% well to very much unwell. And that, of course, gets me back to this this idea of poison. And what, what it is about poison that sort of fascinates us um, or fascinates, you know, people who want to make stories about poisoners or people being poisoned uh, I think it does occupy something. Uh, it occupies a place in our minds and in our psyches. There's something about the 
the hidden the hidden threat there's something about that masked um you know the the the, the masked death really um and how the idea that poison can be so terrifyingly and you know rapidly invasive and certainly if i think of um you know images from from movies of snake bites and how that can sometimes be depicted in movies it's always terrifying to me the idea that a venomous snake has just got their fangs into you and injected their poison and that is in your system and the adrenaline rush accelerates your heart rate which just speeds that poison around the body um yeah i find that (laughs) truly frightening um two two movies come to mind with a snake bite um one is the coen brothers remake of true grit where the young actress i want to call her Hayley Seinfeld, Hayley Senfield, mm, something around that area. That was from around 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago. And she gets bitten by a snake in that um, after she's fallen down a pit. The other one, of course, is uh, poor old Michael Madsen. <laughs> poor old Michael Madsen uh, getting bitten in the face by a snake that jumps out of a suitcase full of cash that he's delightedly uh you know flicking through and he pulls back a wad of bills and suddenly this black snake leaps and bites him right in the cheek and oh it's a jolt that's from uh, yeah tarantino's kill bill i think it's kill bill 2 that sequence oh grim stuff um gladiator comes to mind doesn't derek jacoby meet his end um with snakes in his bed uh anyway um <laughs> okay anyway i wasn't planning to talk about snakes um poison where where have we seen it where does it come up where has it been celebrated two famous victims of poison were socrates the greek philosopher who was basically sentenced to death for poisoning the minds of the young men of uh, where was he was he in Athens I don't know somewhere somewhere there back in the day and he chose death by hemlock and he drank hemlock to uh, to end his own life uh, Rasputin Rasputin the mad monk advisor to uh, the Tsar Nicholas in the, the late 1800s, early 20th century. He was, uh, there was an attempted assassination of Rasputin. There was so much jealousy around his influence over the Romanovs. And he was fed cakes with cyanide, <laughs> which he basically laughed off. <laughs> and so the the killers had to they had to shoot him in the end um so yeah rasputin and uh, you know you know immune immune to poison or just fueled his madness even more um you have then from from shakespeare we have romeo and juliet um taking poison to end their lives and and gosh i'm just about to go blank on the sequence they're they're meant to take a poison that will just kind of put them to sleep and then they can reunite afterwards but doesn't romeo accidentally take too much and he's gone and juliet wakes up and realizes and she drinks the rest of the potion to kill herself um and the the apothecary uh, i always liked pete Postlewaite's um apothecary from Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet uh he was the he was their go-to guy that's where they got their fix Hamlet's father of course has poison poured in his ear in his garden by his treacherous brother Claudius who then 
uh, hooks up with Hamlet's mother, Gertrude. Ah, oh, Jesus, Gertrude, you're better than this. You're better than this. Come on now. And of course, Hamlet ends with poisoning as well. Uh, because there is the sword fight in the, the palace at the end with poison tipped swords and a whole bunch of fellas die. <laughs> um, yeah, great, great stuff. Very dramatic, very dramatic. I did also think of Othello. Now, is there actual poison in Othello? No, there's not. And this, I'm, I might return to Othello later because Othello really, I'm going to argue that Iago, his um, his aide, uh, poisons Othello's mind and poisons Othello by fueling his jealousy uh, and suspicion of Desdemona, and it's it really is. I mean, and it's it's the undoing of Othello, and of course. Othello and Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet they are the tra- they are tragedies not so much poison knocking around in um, in the comedies of Shakespeare you then also have poison cropping up in um, in music you had poison ivy by the coasters um, a black group back in 1959 and I think the stones covered that song as well a little bit later in the early 60s um, then you had to jump forward uh, quite a few years Alice Cooper had his song Poison in 89 Belle Biv DeVoe <laughs> do you remember them? Belle Biv DeVoe the sort of the, the, the hip hop act they had Poison from 1990 and Britney Spears had her own version of this with Toxic in 2003 so it's um you know it, it, it it's a popular it's a popular theme poison as the addictive substance or poison as being emblematic of the danger particularly of women it would seem so i mean there's a whole thesis you can go to there if you wish to about you know ever more misogyny and you know the depiction of women as femme fatales uh and it's funny gosh today i was flicking through a box of books that we just got from um, a friend's house old theater books and i picked up a sam shepherd play uh oh what's it called a line in the dark or damn it it wasn't a play i was familiar with i was marveling at the cast from the 1985 production uh it featured geraldine page Harvey Keitel, Aidan Quinn, um, oh, who else? James Gammon. There was, about, there was only about one actor in the cast who I didn't recognise. So a real heavyweight uh, production from uh, the first Broadway production directed by Shepard himself. Anyway, I just flicked it open on a random page and right there, there was a, a reference to Poison. Um... I was reading Danny the Champion of the World by Roald Dahl to my daughter before bed and in that Danny's father tells uh, he's talking about he's talking about a a teacher the headmaster of Danny's school and uh, Danny's revealing that he found out that the headmaster has gin in his water bottle that he drinks every day and the his father's like, oh, well, you know, I'd, I'd drink something a lot stronger than, than gin. If I was married to the headmaster's wife, uh, I'd drink poison. Ha ha ha. <laughs> so, um, again, again, a little bit of, a little bit of, a little bit of mis- misogyny there, maybe, you can argue, if you wish, if you wish, you know, in the, you know, the delightful, the delightful children's book, Danny the Champion of the World, by Monsieur Dal, the famous anti-Semite. Thanks, Roald. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so there you go. Um, poison, you know, it, it, it gets around. It gets around. I also remember a very funny, well, what I thought was a very funny ad from the 80s for for yogurt. So there was, 
Yoplait yogurts. And I can't remember, for some reason, I think it might have been when they brought out their new range of Petit Falou, the little sort of more kind of moussey, creamier yogurts. And the ad was very simple. It was set in a medieval castle and there was a food taster who'd try everything before it reached the king. And the food taster was completely jaded and blasé about everything that came his way and would just kind of take a desultory desultory bite and you know pass it on to the king and um next thing the yo play yogurt comes along and the taster has a little taste and is instantly you know mesmerized beguiled by this delicious treat and just has to go for another little bit and he's like oh yeah this is very very fishy very suspect better have a bit more and he's just he's he's just you know rapidly devouring the whole thing and the king is impatiently waiting to try it so the food the food the food taster goes here have an apple and the king takes one bite of the apple and drops dead boom boom hilarious and speaking of poisoned apples and maybe you know this this goes back quite far then because you have of course the poisoned apple in snow white so how far back are we going with snow white was that the was that the Grimm brothers or the Perrault brothers? I can't remember where um where the Snow White fairy tale originated. But certainly if you go back and watch the the Walt Disney version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, uh the witch in that is a, a fantastically scary creation and when she comes up to Snow White towards the end and proffers her the poisoned apple, it's a chilling sequence. Uh, and maybe just as chilling is the sequence where she creates the apple in her um, little den with her you know, black raven watching over her. And the she produces the apple from the cauldron and it, the, the, the liquid on the apple drips into the shape of a... Of a uh, of a skull um really yeah very very uh powerful imagery that had probably embedded itself in my 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 young brain when i saw that as a kid um so you know it, it it's out there it's out there the um it's it is it's not a fetishizing of poison but i think it does it speaks to a dread in us and of course when we think of poison as being in the hands of those who would do us harm um not just not just accidental um which of course can happen i mean there, there's that there is that scene that i referred to in the the episode i did on christmas movies that really powerful sequence at the start of it's a wonderful life when the um the young james stewart character um prevents the prevents the pharmacist from sending poison to one of his uh, his patients because the pharmacist is drunk and in a state of shock because he's just received news of his son dying in the war it's um oh it's never fails to get me really such a powerful powerful um sequence um yeah you um I'm going to I'm going to come back to I'm going to come back to movies um in a, in a, in a, in a little moment the oh well oh yeah come back to movies or stay with movies I was thinking of you know the poison of um mustard gas as used in first world war I mean that's been used to horrific effect in uh fictional retellings of 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 battle scenes the horrors of war um and in fact it was used very uh you know vividly and uh scarily in in the wonder woman movie that was made a few years ago uh which was set during the the first world war and um you've got this kind of maniacally uh, ambitious german officer and his somewhat crazy but brilliant female scientist and they're trying to 
trying to develop the gas that will kill everyone. And they test it out on a bunch of non-compliant uh, high-ranking officers who want to end the war. Um, yeah, scary stuff. There was also the poison attack in in Japan in 1995, which uh, was the the sarin gas subway attack, which left 14 people dead. Um, I mean that's yeah, like that that that, that was a you know a, a a terrorist act. I can't remember the name of the group um, responsible, but again, you know, an incident an incident like that just gets into a very sort of primally uh, fearful place in us, and. You could argue, of course, that the, the you know the pandemic tapped into this for a lot of people, um, and continues to because it, it's it's still rolling, um, and that sort of fear of the 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 unknown and well not maybe not the unknown as much as the unseen, the unseen threat, and how it can it can get you, um, maybe in spite of um, you know your your best. Uh, your best behavior and um, you know your, your, the, the due care you may have taken but let's go let's go to let's go to the movies okay let's go to the movies and I'm getting all this stuff I know I'm just kind of listing and going through references and but it's all going to go somewhere so don't despair it's not just it's not just going to be you know more and more of this but again for me, of course, being the movie lover that I am, the the you know, the presence or depiction of of poison in movies um, has has always featured, um, you know, on on one level or another, in um, you know amongst my my movie memories. Um, so of course, I referred to Snow White not too long ago, but another movie. I remember is um, in the name of the rose, which I think was from nineteen eighty six. Uh, the movie version of Umberto Eco's enormous novel, uh, again set in medieval France in a monastery, and people are dying, and it featured Sean Connery as the sort of investigating monk, and Christian Slater as his young apprentice. Uh, and I remember Christian Slater. He, he, he may he may even have only been a teenager at that stage, but he had um, a, quite a startling to my to my to my eyes anyway. At whatever age I was, twelve or thirteen, quite a startling sex scene. Which is going, hold on, do monks have sex with this uh, beautiful young woman? I can't remember how she. You know, how she made her way into the plot but I, I certainly remember that scene um but poison features in that um something you know the the, the 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 an extraordinary cast of faces um really i mean ron perlman is in it and uh, f murray abraham if you're looking for some named actors michael lonsdale is it michael lonsdale not michael lonsdale from no michael longley maybe um but this extraordinary cast of, I think, a lot of Italian actors, just these, um, I mean, grotesques seems to be extremely harsh, but kind of clownish, grotesque, misshapen character faces. Absolutely astonishing. Oh, William Hickey is in that one as well. William Hickey, what a voice, what a face. Um, but yeah, there's poisoning in that. Something to do with the ink that they're using to write their beautiful scriptures and licking their thumb to turn over the pages of vellum and then dying with swollen, blackened mouths. Um, so there was poison there. I also remember um, a little bit later than that, um, DOA. Uh, featuring Dennis Quaid, DOA standing for Dead on Arrival, and Dead on Arrival again 
late eighties, if I recall correctly, and that was a remake of a fifties movie of the same title with Edmund O'Brien. Very simple premise. A man has been poisoned and has twenty four hours to find the antidote, clear up why he's being poisoned, um and yeah. Both quite effective. Um I can't I don't have much memory of either of them other than the premise. Um, and saw them both quite very a very long time ago. Um, one that's well worth checking out if you haven't seen um, is Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Thread, which is uh, a really yeah just a, a I think a masterful um, a masterful movie. There are you know there aren't that many directors at the moment who have that mastery of tone, that surety of touch, the certainty of their vision. Um, And Paul Thomas Anderson is one of them. And you heard me a couple of weeks ago talking about Portrait of a Lady on Fire. That that director, Celine Sciamma, I think she's another. Um, And incidentally, and I'll come, I'm gonna gonna touch on this. um, the Power of the Dog by Jane Campion is a great example of what I'm talking about as well. But Phantom Thread, there's a poison features in that as well. And it's sort of an unexpected element in that story because you've got this, you know, very sort of stereotypically repressed Englishman played by Daniel Day-Lewis, a, a, an amazing tailor and dressmaker to, you know, the, 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 to, to wealthy uh, women of influence and he he finds as his new muse a waitress in you know a humble seaside hotel where he's kind of getting away from it all and he becomes somewhat obsessed with her but also sort of keeps her at arm's length and ultimately it really becomes her who possesses him which is um yeah it's 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 quite a satisfying it's quite a satisfying uh, twist really um and I won't because it's still a relatively recent movie I'm not going to spoil where poison features in that but it's a really yeah it's a very effective part of the story um yeah another one which I thought in my memory it featured poison but it doesn't is Tom Tyquer's 2006 version of Patrick Suskind's Perfume uh, the beloved novel about the French uh, you know cast off orphan you know discarded infant who has the you know the, the most extraordinary sense of smell and can smell everything and identify everything and he ends up becoming a perfumer um who's obsessed with capturing the scent of beauty and becomes a a serial killer in his attempt to capture that essence and the movie is semi successful there's a lot of things that really work in it and i think um ben wishaw as the central character um uh, grenouille the french word for frog of course ben wishaw is really really good he just captures something very unsettling and icky um i mean a relatively early role for him i think he was only 26 when he did it but really really good but tonally it's a bit uneven and it kind of loses its way in the latter part of the movie um but for some reason i thought there was poison in that but it's well, in a way, of course, it's his his perfume is a type of poison in the way that it infiltrates people's minds. It infiltrates what they believe they see and it alters their behavior. And, you know, maybe that's not a bad place to to segue to how we might start to think of aspects of mental health and 
aspects of our sort of uh you know self sabotage self sabotaging thinking as poison now that might sound like an extreme uh jump but i don't think i don't think it's irrelevant i think i think i think we can weave this through if if we travel back to my my vomiting um my vomiting uh, episode and the way i viewed that was the body's extraordinary singularity of purpose in terms of trying to get rid of what it had correctly identified um as the source of my pain and unwellness and it really there's a sort of a you know an an alacrity and an efficiency you know the speed with which the body takes action to go get the hell out of here you know when that is the correct option of course that doesn't work for other illnesses i mean the body has all its different responses depending on what is going on but when it's something that is gut based the intelligence of the body and the complete the complete absence of hesitation the complete absence of prevarication it's like the cogs start turning the second it registers there's something here that shouldn't be here and it just keeps ramping up the discomfort until you <laughs> <laughs> until in my case you reluctantly hold yourself over the toilet bowl or you reluctantly go out into the garden and bend your body over going oh this is going to be so painful um but again i'm going to use that phrase the singularity of purpose that absolutely undistractable focus of getting the job done get rid of this bad element now well done the body by the way congratulations human body why don't we take that idea and apply it to other areas of our life where there are elements that destabilize us where there are elements that upset us set us back where we have you know whatever it might be whatever thing it is that you know that that makes us uh open that door to to what to anxiety that makes us open the door to self-doubt that makes us open the door to depression that makes us open the door to you know negative self-talk that i i like i believe all of those things we can start you know if, if you if you go with this idea you can think of these things as you know drips little drips of poison into our sense of selves little drips of poison into how we perceive ourselves little drips of poison into what we believe we are capable of little drips of poison into what we believe we deserve what we believe we should tolerate or put up with little drips of poison that invalidate our aspirations little drops of poison that that uh rubbish our plans little drops of poison that uh you know that 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 augment or uh blow up our 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 failures our senses you know our our defeats and what if we tried to cultivate in ourselves that singularity of purpose 
that the body has when it's ejecting something from the gut what if we try to cultivate an attitude of incisive um incisive kind of dealing with these things that don't allow us to proceed with a sense of wellness and again you know i say that the objective is not to be going around you know blissfully happy all the time i don't i don't value that as a concept i find it reductive and childish but i do think we have patterns of thinking patterns of behavior patterns of um what do i want to say patterns of self self kind of self creation or self um interpretation that we can find incredibly hard to shake off like and and when i say habits of self interpretation granted you know many of those ideas about ourselves could be positive and we could recognize things that are positive aspects of how we live and how we share our lives with others and how we try to achieve what we want to achieve in our lives but alongside those i believe are other perceptions of self that are profoundly unhelpful and dog us through our lives and i wonder if we could bring in the idea of <laughs> the the idea of why don't i vomit this element out of my psyche why don't i vomit this this kind of this tendril of self doubt you know out of my you know out of the deepest part of myself and of course you can apply that to to real people <laughs> if you want to get really if you if you want to get really demonstrative and start looking around you and go hold on a second buddy you don't bring anything good to my life get the hell out of here and um you know st st start you know just cutting people out of your life um i mean obviously i'm, I'm laughing at that one it's 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 extreme but you know that said we can find ourselves in long term patterns with with people in our lives that that ultimately aren't good for us and they can be the toughest relationships from which to extricate ourselves um but i don't know i mean that that's you know everyone has to sort of work out what their what their sort of threshold is what they feel they can put up with, what they feel they can tolerate, what they feel they can stomach. There you go. We're back with the guts. Um, I find as I get older, I have less and less tolerance for those elements in my life, whether they are in my, you know elements that are internal in my own thinking stuff i've carried over from childhood unresolved stuff um in my in my marriage um you know stuff with you know friends i find i'm just less and less tolerant uh, of things that are that are not positive things that are you know that, that that cause me anxiety things that cause me stress things that um revert me to older patterns of thinking that i've tried to evolve from um now that is you know i i, I don't try to be in denial about you know because that could be a thing where you're so determined to to transcend that you just do this kind of blanket rejection of anything that would possibly 
return you to where you think you've just left. Um, I don't think that's the way forward. I think, I think we can recognize that we have tendencies, inclinations, that there are certain shapes that we fall into, certain forms we fall into that are our learned responses, that are our learned ways of coping. And I think fundamentally, you know, like one of the biggest drivers of so much of our behavior is what feels safest. And so it's not necessarily what feels most rewarding or what makes us, you know, feel most, uh, you know, what, what feels most successful or triumphant. Um, I think it's what's safest, what causes me the least amount of pain. And, you know, if you go back to, if we return to the, the vomiting, <laughs> if, we, if we return to the, the vomiting model, um, what causes me least pain is not throwing up is not is not vomiting i'm dreading vomiting you know that's so but then if you think okay so if the most painful part of vomiting is actually vomiting and then you'd go i don't want that that's that's the most painful part i want to i don't i don't experience that pain therefore the less painful part is to stay in the pre-vomiting state which many of you will know is called nausea 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 <laughs> oh, i feel nauseous right that is i'm sorry no way jose can you stay in that state you know women go through this with morning sickness and you know my wife had a was not a comfortable pregnancy and she had nausea for pretty much the entire pregnancy with some other symptoms that I won't bother share with you here and it was really uncomfortable and unpleasant and it just was unrelenting um so there was very little enjoying the glow of pregnancy um when you basically feel like throwing up 24 7 for uh, eight months as it was in our case because our our daughter was uh, induced a month early for her and my wife's safety um but is that where you want to live you want to live in that state of i just feel like i'm going to be sick all the time and if you take that into you know back into your your wellness regime your self-care regime your dealing with your shit regime you're trying to clean up your emotional and psychological uh, life regime I don't think that's a great choice. Um, now, you know, let's be fair. You know, this whole analogy is clunky and we tend not to maybe do the violent vomiting equivalent of addressing our issues. But it doesn't have to be as literal as that, the, you know, the transfer of the idea. I think... I do come back. I, I, I like. I, I like to come back to that phrase I used, you know, before the the singularity of purpose. Can we bring that level of rigor to addressing our stuff? Because I I believe the gains to be made are huge. Because it frees us up to do so many other things it frees up our energy to be directed in so many other ways that are potentially you know that that will potentially be fruitful that will potentially be rewarding that will be you know potentially be energy giving and edifying you know building us up building us into kind of better people um it's so it's not about some glorious transcendent phoenix like moment the emergence of the new self it's like you are who you are you are the self you are but 
addressing the stuff that dogs us and has you know historically you know tormented us and traumatized us if we can actually address that and excise it get rid of it or put it in a place where it no longer impacts us it just frees up all that space it frees up all that mental space it frees up all that emotional space and allows us to sort of you know move outwards because trauma is very inwards it it it, it keeps us in it keeps us locked in the sort of brokenness of ourselves and locked in the the empty spaces of ourselves and trapped in perpetual reliving of unfulfillable um, conflicts, unresolvable conflicts. And when the sources of those conflicts, and you know, you know, rightly or wrongly, um, you know, when, when the sources of those conflicts are still able to you know impact you that's um you know that's enormously challenging enormously troubling and i would argue you know something that you know something that is neglected at your at your peril um i don't know i mean yeah my my, my feeling is the there's a lot of I don't know if this is. I, I'm just. I'm, I'm thinking. I'm, th- I'm thinking on my seat. I'm just wondering. Like I, I, like I tend to talk as if you know these are very relatable kind of universal experiences, um, which is if you know the other word for that is I'm totally solipsistic and I just assume everyone is having the same experience that I'm having. But I was wondering there is that a very? It's a very maybe it's a very Irish like a cultural Irish thing, the sort of putting up with things and you know just ah look at it. it'll be grand sure we'll all just you know we'll get on with it it'll be fine um you know we'll, you know we'll, we'll just yeah we'll, we'll we'll get through somehow or another with all the sort of crapness and dysfunction and the um the messy the messy lines um i am um, i can't stand that Sometimes, but sometimes I think I'm mad to to have such disdain for that approach because I can see I can see the positive side of that, which is fundamentally, you know, at its best, it is about compromise. It's about being reasonable, which I've claimed to be before. Um, it's about finding middle ground, um, and I have time. I have time for those positions, you know, with, with, you know, without hesitation um but i do feel strongly that when things continue to continue to be you know profoundly broken and unworkable and there's not really a meeting point i just think like cut your losses cut your losses and give yourself a chance for for fresh air, clean air, and you know, clean lines. That's what I like. Um, I remind you, you know, the name of the podcast is the Clear Out. <laughs> there you go. Sure, Jesus Christ, I should have started with that. <laughs> the, <laughs> the vomit, the clear out, <laughs> decluttering, <laughs> clarifying, connecting. I mean, what else was I doing? when at the end of that second vomit session I was like my god there's a podcast in this <laughs> and <coughs> excuse me I mean I, I wrote about this um, on the on the blog years ago my attraction to Shotokan Karate which is one of the most linear styles of martial arts you can find it's all about the fastest way to travel from point A to point B in a, you know, in a self-defense sort of framework. What's the most direct approach to defend, to counterattack? 
to deal with the present threat and I did sort of muse some time ago you know has karate shaped my my kind of personal philosophy or did my personal philosophy pre-exist and that's what attracted me to that style of karate the clean lines the direct approach the linear approach um you know there's a you know there's there's, there's positives and negatives to that um i hope as i get older i i'm capable of being of being less direct and moving around things um you know with uh, a bit less um a, a little bit less kind of antsiness around um i'm i'm just trying to think were there any other sort of threads to kind of throw in there so you know the idea then just to try and wrap up the wrap up the sort of the the wellness related themes i think you know toxic people in our lives they they're they they're a type of poison and they their poison is one that lingers and stays with you you know after they've been in your in your presence and that you know that works very well metaphorically i think what you're left with the feeling of being unsettled the feeling of being agitated aggravated the feeling of being infuriated um the feeling of being manipulated um that's you know that that type of toxic personality gets inside you and you know treads where it should not and treads over your sense of inner peace or inner calm so that's an area where i think you can go yeah okay that's an area of poison that i could look at in terms of you know mental health toxic people in my life personally myself you know when i get into bad headspace when i get depressed my negative self talk can be off the charts and imagine i've had that going on in my life since i was a teenager so minimum minimum 30 years um over 30 years of habitually engaging in you know this <laughs> this this kind of deluge of 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 self-loathing and self-abasement you know verbal self-abasement and you know the the you know, relishing in the the self-destructive impulse and negating every every positive thing in my life um and i've i've learned you know i've learned over the years to just kind of detach from that to a certain extent and go here it is and i've become much better at kind of identifying oh that's the reason i've got upset or that's the reason that i feel like this and now here comes this you know wave upon wave of you know whatever it's not i'm not gonna i won't bore you with articulating the 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 things that i actually say to myself but i can kind of detach without letting it escalate without compounding it with other negative self-harming behaviors i can just kind of look at it and go okay this is this is where it is at the moment i'm just going to kind of breathe through this i mean it's almost you know almost meditative that idea of observing the self rather than being ruled by the self um and it's not you know i'm not saying that it's i'm not saying that it's not unpleasant it is unpleasant and i recognize it and sometimes there is a you know an emotional urgency to it that can feel very um disturbing but um as i say and have said you know different times in the past on the podcast i just kind of look at that and go okay that is what it is that is still uh one part of how i choose to talk to myself in times of temporary personal crisis and i can look at that and go gosh you know is that not a type of poison that maybe i've been indulging or allowing to be present or maybe not doing quite enough to fully cleanse from my system you know maybe this is as good as it'll ever get it's you know i manage it but that is that is something um and 
you know, for me, as I've said, that takes form the form of, you know, a depressive episode. I don't get a huge amount of anxiety generally. Um, but, you know, anxiety is something, of course, that some people get. That can be a very debilitating element. And again, I think that lends itself to the, the, you know, the poison analogy. Um, yeah, I mean, look, there are other things as well. You know, habits, the habits we have. Kind of, you know habits that are not good for us what we indulge that's unhealthy uh the things that we avoid um the the excuses we make to avoid things that we recognize would be better choices i mean all of that can fall into this category as well ask yourself why do i indulge the less positive choice why do i indulge the suboptimal um option the suboptimal choice why do i go for that one why do i say that's easier even when i know on the other side of it i'm going to feel worse um you know that that this is something we may revisit with discipline um when i eventually come back to discipline um but as i said for now discipline can wait um look i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap up i um i hope you've got something out of this <laughs> i uh i heartily recommend you watch jane campion's the power of the dog what a again you know that's a movie that's going to get under your skin if you go with it some fantastic performances particularly from um uh benedict cumberbatch really but the, the four main performances benedict cumberbatch jesse plemons kirsten dunst and uh the young australian actor jody smith mckee the, the four of them the four of them all do really really good work but you know ultimately i came away you know in great admiration of jane campion's gifts uh jane campion who you know probably really made her mark or came to prominence with the piano uh, all those years ago with um, Harvey Keitel, Sam Neill, uh, Holly Hunter and a, a very young Anna Paquin who was the daughter of the mute Holly Hunter and spoke for her in what many people described as a really annoying Scottish accent. It never bothered me at the time. I think that's going back to 1990 perhaps, 90 or 91. Um, I think it stands up very well still, the piano um and again that kind of yeah the the female lens the female gaze um a lot more control a lot more covered up a lot more suggested a lot more um understated and unsaid um and again campion all those years later is using displaying those gifts with just tremendous uh, confidence, tremendous feel. The, 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 what I came away with from The Power of the Dog, and I'm not going to indulge in any spoilers here whatsoever. You can, it's, it's, on, um, it's on Netflix. You, you, you really should check it out. But texture, texture and tone and mood. So, you know, very for me very kind of poetic terms uh, and very aesthetic terms but really just using the camera well her sense of composition and her sense of light um you know obviously in collaboration with her cinematographer i didn't check the cinematographer's name but um yeah really 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 good stuff and you know, insofar as movies can get under your skin, they're their own kind of poison, you know. Um, and don't forget, you know, poison, you know, poison has a flip side, you know, which is sort of the, 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 the anti-venom side of, you know, what can cure poison is the same thing as what poisons you. You know, hence the uh, the hair of the dog, as, as the drinkers say. Um, but I remember being in a, a reptile zoo in Gosford in New South Wales and Australia uh, be 
on a, on a holiday it was before we, we lived in Australia uh, or before I moved out there with my wife visiting this reptile zoo and they had their little laboratory in there where they were milking um, venom from spiders uh, I mean funnel web spiders which are particularly poisonous and yes you know, so it's a reminder that you know those same things those same things that kill us can um, you know there, there, there's there's a cure there's a cure in in extracting them so there you go again extraction and taking taking that power and, and, and flipping it around to, uh, to to make us well um, by facing into it okay okay I think that's all I've got there's probably you know 27 other points I wanted to make but um, like I said this episode is going to be going live in less than an hour and uh i've still got a few bits and pieces to um to pull it all together so i uh, as i said i hope you got something for it from it <laughs> oh i said it was going to end with blockages <laughs> it is ending with blockages so last night in the lashing rain on a really stormy night i was standing out the back of the house trying to clear drains because one of the toilets wouldn't flush and yes everything vile you can imagine was in those drains and they are still they are still blocked and the professional came today and they are still blocked and someone else is coming tomorrow and i very much hope they will not be blocked any longer it's been uh, quite a few days um i i did want to throw in um calvin and hobbs calvin and hobbs the uh <laughs> the great the great thinkers calvin and hobbs the the cartoon the comic strip by bill watterson calvin is his great creation this uh precocious um fiery kid and his stuffed tiger who comes to life when no one else is looking um but bill watterson always depicted calvin's struggle with food and dinner that he didn't like so hilariously to me and very evocatively for me because i was a very picky eater as a kid and we are experiencing the same battles with my daughter at the moment and she picks through her food yes folks as if it's poison viewing every grain of rice suspiciously picking out a lump of suspicious vegetable and it is excruciating but i do think of calvin and i see my daughter and in my daughter i see myself and i go what can you do jesus what can you do okay that's it that's all i've got thank you so much for listening as always and uh, please do continue to listen please uh, subscribe to the podcast like it send me some love on social media um the clear out podcast on facebook on instagram on you youtube uh the clear out two that's number two uh quite a bit of that number two in the drains i'm sorry to say that's a nice note to leave you on um yes and if you ever decide you'd like to email me with some suggestions for what we could talk about um the clear out live at gmail.com you can also throw me some financial love if you want to support the podcast you can use the supporter link which will be there somewhere in the description wherever you're listening to this or use the patreon link which is patreon.com forward slash the clear out so there are many different ways you can show you're enjoying what i'm doing and helping to keep an independent podcast going This has been episode 39 of The Clear Out. And I have been and still will be Dara Clear. Thank you so much for listening. Take care of yourselves. All the best. Bye.